you'll give me just a moment, I'll pull up my presentation. Okay. So basically what we're talking about are the steps to college admissions for juniors. And I'll let you know, this is a very basic overview. I'm, I've got relatively little information for you. Mainly what I wanted to do was give you the opportunity to ask questions that may be on your mind. But I met with the juniors on Monday in their junior English classes and went over this information with them. So I wanted to share it with you as well. So here's where, where we are in the college admissions timeline. Um, all of the juniors have been given a, an 11th grade college planning calendar that they can access. And you can actually also access on the Google Classroom. There's a Google Classroom called Ms. Marble's Office Hours that uh, Ms. Marble, who is the grade level counselor, and I share. What I talked to the juniors most about on Monday are these four required tasks that need to be completed by them in order for me to write them a great letter of recommendation for college admissions. Um, most colleges out there require something called a school letter of recommendation. It's also sometimes known as a counselor letter of recommendation that we send along with the transcript to colleges that require it. And in order for me to write a really strong letter, I asked the juniors to each each complete these four required tasks that we'll talk about in just a minute. And they're working on that right now. They also should be in the process of researching colleges, looking for great college fits for them, great college options, places where they might like to apply. What I told them is at this point in the game, they should be expanding their options. I want them to have a really big list of colleges in the spring that they're looking at, they're exploring, they're adding to. I want them to have more colleges than they could possibly apply to at this point, broaden their options, broaden their horizons. And then by the time they come back and start senior year in August, that's the point at which they need to narrow their focus and know where they're actually planning to apply. So they basically have you know, roughly seven or eight months now to get a really big list and then to sort of pare it down as they get closer to August. When they come back and start school as seniors, they should already know where they plan to apply. They might add one, drop one, you know, make a few tweaks, but the basic list should be assembled by that point for them to be on track. They actually can begin applying to college after junior year final grades have been posted in early June. Um, most colleges in the, in the state of Alabama open their applications over the summer. They open them in June. So if students wanted to, they could go ahead and begin applying to in-state colleges. A lot of colleges at more selective colleges um, do not open their applications until August, especially if students are planning to apply using the common application. They can begin working on the common application, but they can't actually submit it to any colleges until usually about the first week in August when it gets rolled over um, from this year's seniors until next year's seniors. And then next year, they'll get a senior course, sorry, a senior year college planning calendar. Um, it's actually already available in a book called The Next Step, Planning for Life After ASPA, that you can find on the ASPA College and Career website. And that will give them ideas um, about what they should be doing month by month during senior year. All right, so back to that there's four required tasks that I need students to do in order for me to write them a really great letter of recommendation. Here's what I ask them to do. And all of these are due Friday, March 3rd, with the exception of the first one, which is a resume that they need to work on. And they have two weeks to write that. The, the, the resume itself is actually due Monday, February 6th, two weeks from the Monday that I introduced this to juniors. And actually, I've actually already gotten a few of them turned in. So I'm, I know that they're pretty excited about that and are working on that busily. I went over how to write a resume for college admissions and college purposes, and they've, they've been given a number of different samples. There's at least one, sometimes two samples for every specialty program at ASPA that your student can look at, use as a model, and use that to base their own resume on. They are also more than welcome to send that resume to me as they're working on it if they would like feedback 
And after they turn it in, I will definitely give everybody feedback on their resume to give them some advice on how they might improve it. But basically the resume is so that they can share with me any specialty activities they're involved in, any extracurricular activities, leadership, awards they may have won. Basically, it's their brag sheet. And then of course, they can use that um, when they apply to colleges, they can use it when they apply for scholarships. There will be lots of uses for that resume. So we actually tell students to hold on to that resume after they turn it in and continue to update that throughout the next year. If anything, any developments happen, if anything good happens for them, they can add that to their resume and keep update, updating it. And then of course, continue to update it as they use it through college and beyond. The second thing I ask all the juniors to do is something called the student brag sheet, the student brag form. This is a survey that's on SCORE. SCORE is a program that we have all um, asked the students to use to research colleges. And also next year, they'll be using it to request documents when they need to send a transcript to a college, for example, or send another document to a college. They do that through SCORE. Um, there's also ways that they can submit things to me and the student brag sheet is one of them. It's a, a short survey, something like five or six questions that I ask them to answer for me, just to give me some more insight into them and what they, um, what they bring to the college application process so that I can brag about it to the college on their behalf. I also ask all of the seniors, I'm sorry, all of the juniors to meet with me at least once this semester. They can schedule using that link that you can see, or I told them they're also always welcome to just drop by my office. That's fine as well. I, I require one meeting. They're more than welcome to have more than one meeting with me. It can be, yeah, I think it's really wonderful when we can establish a relationship and have a back and forth. So feel free to encourage them that as they have questions during the process, as you have questions during the process, that they can reach out to me more than just once. But I do require at least one meeting in person. And then the last of the four tasks that I want the juniors to do is ask a teacher of their choice. It can be a specialty teacher, it can be a core academic teacher, um, a teacher of their choice to fill out something called the teacher insights form. And this is a short survey, again, it's probably like five or six questions that the teacher is going to share information about that student with me, what kind of a student they are, what their strengths are. Um, really, it's an opportunity, again, it, there's a lot of bragging that goes on here. I want the teachers to brag about that student to me and give me great stories about that student and how they perform in a classroom that I can include in my letter of recommendation. Now, there, there are a few things that are optional, but I recommend them as well. Parents and guardians are welcome to meet with me along with your student. Um, I'm available every day between 8 a.m. and 3.15 p.m. You're welcome to come to ASMA if you'd like to. We can do a Zoom meeting if that works better, um, but I'm available. So my door is open to you as well. I also ask parents to do a brag form. Again, it's optional, so don't feel any pressure, but um, you can get onto your SCORE account and all parents have been invited to create a SCORE account, register that. Um, you either went ahead and did that back last year when they were 10th graders or just recently, I also sent out, for parents who didn't get a chance to do that, I sent out an email inviting you again to register your account on SCORE. And once you log into SCORE, you can go under your profile, click on surveys, and you'll find the parent brag form there as well. And then finally, there's a career assessment on SCORE that will be available at least through May or June of this year. SCORE has announced that they're, um, that they're deleting that particular career assessment. It's called U Science, which is really unfortunate. I think it's a good career assessment. We actually asked all of the, all of your students to do it last year when they were 10th graders during their 10th grade English classes. Um, and hopefully they had a chance to do that. But if they haven't, there's still time for them to do a career assessment and get some insights into what they might want to do um, in terms of careers. Again, that, uh, U Science is going to be available through June, at least May or June, so they have time to do that. I think it's a pretty good one. There will be another career assessment after U Science disappears from SCORE. I have not seen it yet, so I can't speak to the quality. So that's why we're recommending that they go ahead and take care of 
the career assessment sooner rather than later since we know the one that's currently there is pretty good. And basically, all of that is, again, I have to have all four of those required, the first four tests completed in order for me to write a strong recommendation letter. And unless I have all four of them done, I won't write a letter of recommendation because it's, it's just not going to be very strong and that doesn't do anybody any good. So if you have any questions about that, if they have questions about it, they're more than welcome to use it. All right. So let's talk a little bit about ACT and SAT testing because I know that's on a lot of families' minds as well. So all of the juniors are registered or will be registered to take the ACT. I said with writing, but that's actually not true. It's just going to be the ACT without writing. It'll be on March 7th, and that's during the school day at ASPA. It'll, well, it's during the ASPA school day, but it'll actually be over in the um, Birmingham Jefferson Convention Center across the street. We also recommend, though, that if juniors want to, that they go ahead and register to retake the ACT later on and or give a try to another test called the SAT. Colleges will take either one of these tests. They're happy with whatever score you get on either one or whichever is the higher score is what the college will take. Um, so students might want to consider retaking it on their own or taking the SAT on their own and seeing how they do on that. In order to register for those tests on their own, for ACT, you go to actstudent.org. And for SAT, you go to collegeboard.org. And then you choose a, a date, usually it's a Saturday, um, and choose a location that's convenient for you. And they can go ahead and take that test. Just so you know, there's great ACT and test, SAT testing information from a company called Compass Prep. And I have a link right there that you might check out. Also, I've given students um, test prep resources. They can go on the Google Classroom again, and they can find ACT and SAT test prep resources, including ones that you pay for, free ones, online, in-person, a whole variety of different ACT and SAT testing, um, test prep information that can be helpful to them. The one thing I, I want students to know is test preparation works. It really does. And, you know, I tell them you wouldn't go into an audition without practicing first, right? So for the same reason, you want to do some practice before you, students take this test. So um, one resource that I like for students is called Khan Academy. It offers free SAT test prep. But in all honesty, even though it's, it's geared for the SAT, it is also very helpful for the ACT. The, the tests are not that different fundamentally. So if you practice for one, it's going to benefit you on the other one. Also. When students took the PSAT back in October, they got a PSAT score report that includes links to personalized test prep as well that they can use. And then again, I give them a list of test prep resources that they might want to take advantage of, anything from classes, individual tutors, library programs, online, free books, lots of different options, whatever fits your, your schedule and your budget. Um, just a word about testing. Currently, what we're seeing is for this year's senior class, most colleges are test optional, meaning you have the option of either submitting test scores if you want to, or if you don't want to, you can apply without test scores and the colleges will simply consider you, they'll pay more attention to the rest of your application. They just, they don't hold the test scores against you. They just pretend the testing doesn't exist. We don't know what's going to happen yet with your class, with the class of 2024. Um, it looks like most colleges are remaining test optional. There have been a very few, a very small minority of colleges who have said they're coming back to requiring testing, but it looks like most of them will remain test optional. Does that mean you shouldn't test? No, it doesn't mean you shouldn't test. You should give it a try, see how you do it, because if a student is a good tester and does well on the test, that can only help them. But if a student is not a strong tester or their test results don't reflect what they think their academic preparation is, that's fine. They just apply test optional and continue on their merry way. So there's a lot more options that we had um, prior to the pandemic. And this is how you can reach me. This is my email address, rrusty at askthschool.org. I'm more than, more than happy to meet with you, answer questions, um, set up conversations, whatever works for you. Like I said, I really wanted this to be a very short presentation. 
and have lots of time for you to answer questions or ask your questions that you may have. Hopefully you can see me again. All right, so that's the end of our formal presentation. What questions do you have for your junior? Ms. Rutsky, yeah. uh, I'll start off. So um, this is Crawford and Georgia Downs. We actually just had a senior graduate from the math science program at ASFA last year. And a kind of an interesting piece of information for those other parents. So we're pretty facile with what you've been telling us. And, um, but a good piece of information I think that, that um, people should know is that there are some state schools, uh, Auburn, where James went is in particular, where it is test optional, but their in-state scholarship money is very tied to testing. Um, you know, James got basically a full tuition scholarship, which is not available to kids who do not submit a test score. Right. That's that's good information. A lot of colleges have gone test optional, but some of them have still retained a connection, sometimes a very strong connection between test scores and merit money. So that's something that you definitely want to be investigating as you're researching colleges. If, if financial issues, if, if finances are an issue for your family, which they are for most of us, um, you definitely want to talk to the college about what they require for students to be considered for merit scholarships. Um, it really is all over the place. I, definitely for in-state public universities and even private universities to some extent here in the South, um, especially here in Alabama, test scores remain very important. Although I'll tell you, most colleges, even here in the state, will consider you for merit-based scholarships. They just, you may not be eligible for the very highest levels of them if you don't submit a test score. No, that's right. I think Auburn last year when James went in, and by the way, thank you very much for all of your information, which I thought we were very well prepared Good. for him going to school. And so listening to you and sort of rehash this, I'm like, oh yeah, we did all that and it was very helpful. But I think the maximum scholarship that you can get as a at Auburn as an in-state student is I think $3,500. And James got 13,000 when he submitted his test score. So that just gives you an idea about sort of the idea that certainly um, it varies school to school, obviously, but that was one where we were really actually very surprised to sort of figure that out right. post, post testing. Uh, so anyway, that's just something to, to recognize. But anyway, we appreciate your efforts. Thank you. That's, it's super helpful to know. It's super helpful to know. And it is, it is the wild west out there. I don't, I don't pretend otherwise. It is the wild west. Um, after COVID, what used to be, or prior to COVID, there were some kind of accepted rules that we could share and, you know, words of wisdom. It was, it was pretty straightforward. Here's how college admissions works. Here's how, you know, after COVID, like so many other things, suddenly a lot of the rules went out the window and what happens at one college is not the same at another college. What happens one year is not the policy next year. So definitely you have to be on your toes. Um, talk to the colleges, ask them what their current policies are, and then be very careful to say, hey, I'm talking about next year. This may be your policy this year, but what's your policy going forward? Because what's happening this year may not be what they're planning for next year. What other questions do you have? Hey, this is Virginia. I have a question. Um, I also just wanted to say so that you're aware, I unless I'm seeing a different screen, we did not see any slides or oh, anything no. I could it's possible I could have been looking at a different screen but just so you're aware in the recording uh, we don't we didn't get the links and stuff through that um, or I didn't and then my question was with the score app um, that you're that you're using with the kids I noticed that there's a parent partner app with that a score parent mm -hmm. do you know does that link up with our with what's happening inside of our kids app and we can see, you know, their list of colleges and things going on with that, or how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. It does link up. Um, I have not, I'll be honest about it. I have not used the apps, the app versions of score. I've seen screenshots, but I haven't used them myself. Your parent account, your parent score account links up with your parent, I'm sorry, with your student score account. 
So you absolutely can see, for example, what colleges they're looking at. You can see what colleges they're following. You can research colleges along with them. So a lot of the same data that they're able to see, you're able to see. Um, the big difference is when it comes time to do those, those brag sheets, the student brag sheet and the parent brag sheet, you have to be logged into your parent account to be able to do the parent brag sheet. And the student has to be logged into their student account to do the student brag sheet. But my understanding is that's pretty much the only, the only material difference you see between the two accounts. Okay, thank you. And thank you for letting me know about the screen. I, technical stuff is not my strength. So I will definitely be sharing the slide presentation that I did. So you'll be able to get that and, and get any links. I'll share, with, share that with everybody tomorrow. Great, yeah, no problem. I just wanted to make sure you knew. Yeah, I had no idea. <laughs> Um, Ms. Wisniewski, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, so this is Linda, I'm Kat's mom. Um, we're having a challenge finding colleges with the specific programs she was looking for because they all call it something different. Right. It's sequential arts at one school, it's comics and illustration at another school. Everybody calls it something different, so just the search engines and the different websites you had given us last year aren't really narrowing it down to what she's looking for. You know, we get illustration, but this is, you know, that's not exactly what she's looking for. There is a difference between the two. So do you have any suggestions? I wish I did. I mean, she's, we've, we've got it down to, you know, we've, we've got like four right now, one of which is in Minneapolis. And I'm like, mm, yeah, okay. Um, that's really cold. Uh, so, um, but are there any, do you have any ideas? <laughs> I don't have it because you're, she's looking at programs that unfortunately do get called different things at different colleges. There's no easy way. That, I don't know of one search engine that lets you. Okay. So it's basically, we just need to keep digging. Just keep digging. If you, okay. <laughs> if I didn't, I might be able to share, send me an email or call me tomorrow. Um, I might be able to share different search okay. engines that sometimes one search engine will turn up more information than others. There is one search engine that I really like called College Navigator, but you, okay. you can search by major, but it, it does have the same problem where, you know, if one college calls it something different, if you put in sequential art and another college calls it illustration, yeah, they're not gonna, yeah. it's not gonna show up. All right, okay, thank you. Yeah, I wish there were an easy answer. <laughs> it's sometimes talking to the colleges, um, find, Find colleges that offer the program that you like and then contact the professors in that college or, or sometimes the admissions people, um, but contact them and say, hey, if my child can't come there or if my child, you know, they know you're looking at other colleges, just say, where are yeah. the other great programs in sequential art? Where are the other great programs in comics? And they well, that actually is how we, that's actually how we found one in, in Ohio. Um, we, we also like printed out the the courses the actual courses that they you would take over four years and have like started trying to compare those to other schools you know that don't specifically have something spelled out so i was just hoping there was going to be a less arduous process <laughs> but i you know it is what it is but. yeah i wish there were an, um, an easy button for that one but i i have not found it yet okay thank you Uh, Ms. Rusky, I have one other question. We've sort of noticed that sort of since COVID, as you said, it was kind of the Wild West, that all of a sudden schools have gotten, um, I'm not going to say they se they're seemingly more competitive in terms of admissions, um, in terms yeah. of getting into schools that, you know, five years ago probably would not have been an issue and all of a sudden it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Have you been seeing that shift at all as the sort of COVID thing has straightened out and kids have gotten back in a standard program or what are you hearing from your cohorts? What we're seeing for the most part is um, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a tale of two cities. For selective colleges, schools that are popular, that are selective, in general, they have become, since COVID and during COVID, they became more selective. For most colleges out there, they actually have become less selective because in the country, you may already know this, but overall the number of high school seniors who are graduating 
is actually dropping. So the population of college of traditional college age students is dropping nationally, especially in the Northeast and the Midwest. So in those areas, especially, those colleges are really hurting for students for the most part. And so they're they actually have more seats and are trying harder to get students and attract them. The problem is, is for the popular colleges, the more selective colleges, what happened was during COVID, as soon as colleges said, we're going test optional because so many students had trouble taking the ACT or the SAT, colleges went test optional. What tons of students and families did at that point was say, woohoo, Harvard is test optional. I'm applying, I'm gonna get into Harvard or you know whatever highly selective college it is suddenly, those colleges became even more popular and more and more people decided they would apply because the barrier of the test score disappeared in their mind. Um, and that just drove the number of applications to those schools up higher, making them even more selective to get into. It became harder and harder. And it's kind of this self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm, um, gotcha. I don't know what's gonna happen. I, I can't, I have no prediction. The only prediction I can say is it looks like for most colleges overall, that are not as selective, they will continue to become easier to get into and more generous with their financial aid. The problem is, is if you're aiming at a more selective college, we, we, don't, we can't predict, will it continue to be as difficult as it has been? Will it settle out? Your guess is as good as mine. I, I feel like at least in the short term, as long as test optional becomes, or not becomes, as long as test optional as as popular as it is, we're going to continue to see lots and lots of people applying to those highly selective schools. And so they'll, they won't become any easier to get into. Great, thanks. I think I saw Mr. Underberg, you were trying to un unmute and ask a question. Hi, uh, yeah, it's, it, it goes along with the selection of schools. It's certainly a very personal choice. and. Beyond curriculum, um, when looking at smaller colleges, liberal arts colleges, uh, any recommendations on any sources that kind of uh, independently uh, help with uh, judging how the quality of the school, you know, beyond US News and World Report rankings and those kinds of things, uh, just evaluating the, I guess, the, the soundness and the quality of the school on a, on a small school. Do you have any recommendations? Um. There are some great books out there just to start identifying some of those um, the, the smaller schools and liberal arts schools. One of the ones that I like a lot is called Colleges That Change Lives. It's a relatively small book. It only has about 40 colleges listed in it, but those are some wonderful hidden gems across the country. In terms of evaluating the quality of, a, of the education, I'll be honest about it. 30 years ago, when I was applying to college, you would see a huge difference, huge disparities in the quality of education from institution to institution. That has, has really narrowed in, the, in 30 years. Part of that is there's such a glut of PhDs being produced that there are so many good professors basically looking for jobs in most fields that colleges that may not have been as strong 30 years ago now have fabulous faculty. So I don't think that you see the same disparities between, you know, really great colleges versus very weak colleges anymore. It's, it's really the, the playing field has leveled in a lot of really good ways, um, and that can be really helpful. I think probably your best bet is, is to look at things like accreditation. Um, make sure that the school is regionally accredited, first of all. Um, for example, you know, is, is accredited by the Southeastern Association of Colleges and Universities or Western, blah, blah, blah. It has to be regionally accredited. So make sure whatever you do is, is regionally accredited. And then think about and ask, are the individual programs that your student is looking at, are those accredited as well? Because they, you know, a, a, an individual program within a university may not be accredited, even if the university itself is. And that's one way to just to judge the soundness of the program. But I'll be honest about it. I think. So much of what you have to do as, a, as a, a college consumer is do that research yourself. There aren't a lot of, I, I can't point to, you know, here is a, a, a resource that I would use for this. I, there isn't a book out there that says, here are 50 great liberal arts colleges. Um, but what you can do is ask those questions yourself. You know, if you can visit, that's the best thing to do. Talk to professors. 
talk to students, go to the career center, um, sit in on the classes, see what you think about the quality of, of the education, talk to the students, talk to the recent alumni, ask what kinds of job placement they're getting. Um, those are just some tips that I would give offhand. I've got a resource that as you're visiting colleges or, or researching colleges, I've got a, a, a nice resource and I can't think of the name of it right off the top of my head, um, but it's a short brochure that has questions to ask while you're on a college tour or, or visiting a college if you're doing it virtually. Really good questions about the quality of undergraduate education because one of the things you do wanna keep in mind is the overall reputation of the college matters but for your student, they're going in for those first four year degrees. They're, they're going for an undergraduate education. And so you wanna make sure that the college really puts resources into educating the undergraduate, that they don't just put resources into the graduate students. They don't just have great, you know, great research out there that doesn't necessarily, that your undergraduate student doesn't get access to. So if you'll remind me, send me an email, or I'll try to remember to put this out on the um, Google Classroom. I've got a nice resource that gives you questions to ask that really, I think, sort of kind of put the college on the, on, on the spot in a good way to you know, tell you how the quality of their, of their undergraduate education is. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll reach out to you about that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Ms. Rusky, it's, it's uh, Courtney French Hanna's father. Hi. Um, and I know my wife, she's on as well. Um, as far as the uh, trying to uh, come up with a list and a good list that's not too broad, but that's not too narrow of colleges, uh, in your experience, what has been a, a good number of uh, colleges to apply to or that you've seen that's been sort of a just a range um that you know not 50 schools but you know not one uh is there an ideal number that you uh think or based upon your experience or you've told students that uh with the application process i know it's a little easier now to kind of uh apply to to more uh, at one time but what are your thoughts about that yeah that's a great question it's really individual um, I'll be honest about it. I can tell you on average at ASPA, most students apply to five or six colleges. That's our average. The national average is a little bit higher than that. It's closer to like six or seven. So that gives you an idea of the averages. But I'll be really honest with you. I have seen students who have applied to one or two and because they did their research and they really narrowed it down and they knew really where they wanted to go or they might've had a very specific program in mind, they were very happy with their results. I've had students apply to many, many more. I won't tell you the, the top number of students or the top number of colleges that, that people have applied to because I don't want it to become an arms race. Um, my general recommendation is you want to keep it under 10. That's my 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 general, you know, try to keep it not much higher than 10. And the reason for that is applying to college really especially for these more selective colleges, it takes a lot of time. Not only are you writing an essay, but for some of these colleges, they actually require something called supplementary essays, um, which means in addition to writing the main essay for the application, the college has these little baby essays, these little short essays that they want you to write in addition that are specific to the college itself. So for some, some places like you know Princeton, for example, they have something like six supplementary essays. It's a lot of writing, it's a lot of extra work that you have to do. And then if you throw into that interviewing, um, financial aid forums, all of that good stuff, it can actually get to be pretty time consuming. So I don't want students to get so overwrought and have so many places that they're applying to that they don't do a good job of the colleges where they are applying. So you have to kind of balance that. Um, but again, it's very individual. And when we have students applying to more selective programs, like for example, the performing arts, when we have students applying to musical theater, for example, or music school, some of those programs are so popular and so difficult to get into that students unfortunately have to apply to a lot of different schools. They really have to have a larger number than we might like. So it's so individual and it really depends on the student, what their planned major is, how selective the colleges are they're applying to, um, that's something that we can kind of, I think, works better if we talk about it individually rather than trying to give up a generic one-size-fits-all recommendation. 
Thank you. Hi, Ms. Rutsky and everyone. This is Georgia Downs. And um, I'm just going to throw this out there. Uh, we had a good friend last year who suggested um, it's a very general book, but it was the Fisk Guide. Um, and that kind of kicked off our kind of family search, like just sitting down and it was a good, you know, book as opposed to a computer screen and just thumbing through it and looking up programs or looking up schools. But the part of it that I personally really liked was that if you picked out a school, any school, then it had a list of other schools to consider. Like if this sounds good to you, check out this list of 10 schools or five schools or something. And it was just a great cross-referencing, kind of opening the door to some schools that I, you know, either had never heard of or hadn't thought about um, that were specific to, you know, interests that our son or daughter has. So I thought that was really helpful and was kind of a nice lead in to the process and wasn't as overwhelming. It didn't seem it's a big fat book, which is kind of overwhelming, but they break it down nicely. But it is, and it's a really user-friendly book. Um, I've got a copy mm -hmm. in my office. I think there's one in the library as well. Yeah. The thing about the Fisk Guide is you don't have, I mean, it's nice to have the latest and greatest edition, but you can actually go to Amazon and buy one a year old. It, they don't change that much. You know, like the tuition might change because the tuition goes up every year, but you can actually buy a used copy and get good information that way. You reminded me, there's another resource that I like um, that can be helpful for finding colleges. It's called The College Finder by Stephen Antonoff, A-N-T-O-N-O-F-F. -F. And what I like about Antonoff's book is, first of all, he's got a list of pretty much any topic you can, any, any academic program you can think of. He's got a list of colleges that are very strong in those programs. So, you know, if you want a good art program, it'll be there. You want a good aerospace engineering program, it'll be there. But he also has great little kind of interesting topics in there. Like, do you want a, a conservative college? Do you want a liberal college? Do you want a college for really social people? Do you want an athletic college? Anything you can think of. I mean, just really interesting lists of possibilities. You can identify yourself in that book and find a list of colleges that, you know, colleges for the clothes horse. I mean, you name it, you've got a list in there. And that's actually available on, it, it's both in book form and it's part of a website as well. Can't think of the name of the website where it is, but if you email me, I'll I'll send it to you tomorrow. Other questions? Trying to get the link for my slide presentation so I can put it in the comments, but unfortunately, Apps's um, system is not letting me log in to do that. So I'll have to post that tomorrow. Okay, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. If you have more questions, feel free to contact me um, during the school day call me, email me, I'm available. I do want you to know my door is open to you. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time on the seniors, but the seniors are kind of in a good place for the most part. They're all pretty much either they've heard from their colleges or they're waiting to hear from their colleges. So they're, they're able to cruise at this point. Now the juniors are really my main focus. So I want you to know that I am available to you if you have any questions. So I want to be respectful of your time, give you the rest of your evening back and say thank you very much for being here tonight. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Ms. Rusky. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.